so I'm going to talk today, <clears throat> good, as the subject suggests, about our uncertain times and the role of philosophy in the battle for a free society. And the first thing I want to suggest is that the battle always goes at different levels of abstraction. I'm a philosopher by training. We can talk about freedom in the abstract and all of the arguments and counter arguments. But the way it almost always works is that while those arguments are going on at a very abstract level, in the broader intellectual world and in the broader culture, there are more specific issues that come to the fore and much of a culture's energy is focused on those particular issues. And the battle for liberty or against is fought at that level and then sometimes there are more general lessons. Now in our generation, as I say the last 20 years or so, the top three issues in academic world and more broadly in intellectual life and now particularly in broad culture, issues of race have come to the fore. Issues of class and the concept of privilege, right, and its uh, varied uses has come to the fore. Issues of sex, gender, sexism, and so forth. So these are particularly in an academic context, the, the holy trinity, so to speak, the big three around which much of academic and intellectual life is being organized and reorganized, race, class, and gender. Now, to put this in context, though, there is a liberty-oriented position with respect to all three of those things. But uh, to give a somewhat potted history, since we have gotten out of the Dark Ages, and there were Dark Ages, medieval period, particularly a subset of it, and we start to get into the modern world, and liberty does advance, and it's been an enormously wonderful success story over the past five to 600 years. It's easy to be pessimistic, but I do want to pause and note that we have had a lot of victories. And basically, on every major battle over the course of the last 500 years, the modern world, the liberal position has won, and that's great. And uh, uh, despite all of our current concerns and uncertainties and will we win this time, we have a really good track record. So the, if you go to the 1400s, this is the uh, beginnings and height of the, the Renaissance. So these would be the generations of Leonardo, Michelangelo, and huge battles, battles rather over whether artists and aesthetic expression can and should be free. So this is uh, generations in which there were literal bonfires of the vanities, right, to uh, Savonarola and people activated by a kind of authoritarian religious outlook. Anything that was the expression of the wrong ideas, so paintings, sculptures, even uh, jewelry, right, and, and, and wrong thinking books would literally be put in bonfires and burned. And so that was perhaps the greatest cultural battle. Now, that's not to say that people weren't fighting for liberty in other areas, but this was the one that came to the fore. And the liberal position did prevail. The bonfire of the vanities went away. In the next century, in the 1500s, lots of issues on the table, but perhaps the most important one was religious liberty. Am I going to be free to read scripture, think for myself, make my own judgments, publicly announce, start my own churches, dissociate from other churches. And of course, for all of the 1500s, it was ugly. It was nasty. It was brutal and on into the 1600s until finally uh, uh, the liberal position, broadly speaking, won. And that came to be the era where we, by and large, separated church and state, got politics out of religion, got much of religion out of politics and in the more broad cultural sphere, learned to live with the idea that individuals should make up their own minds about religion. In the 1600s, early sciences had started to develop. Are we going to be free to do anatomical investigations? Right? Or is that going to be a crime punishable by certain sorts of death? So Andreas Vesalius and other early anatomists are arguing for an extension of uh, uh, liberties with respect to scientific investigations, with respect to the human body. The most famous, of course, of the cases of scientific freedom is the case of Galileo, 
who aside from being a great scientist was also a very sharp philosopher and arguing for scientific method on philosophical grounds, but also the social space within science has to take place. That we need intellectual freedom, we need cultural freedom for scientists to put forth outlandish ideas in some cases, that we're gonna have big arguments about just about everything, and of course, he eventually prevailed. Unfortunately, not until after his official science, uh, silencing rather, but the Galileo position did prevail. And by the time we get to the end of the 1600s, uh, particularly in Northern and Western Europe, uh, there was vigorous scientific inquiry uh, in all major areas of science, and we can see the foundations for what we now think of as modern science being put in place and institutionalized by the end of the, end of the 1600s. The 1700s, more political battles. Now, there's, this is the century of uh, uh, political revolutions. We've all heard of all of these revolutions. Uh, I'd like to start with the Glorious Revolution in England in 1688, which was very successful. Of course, the English, over the course of the next century, and more broadly, the British, they went back and forth between reestablishing more feudal political organizations and becoming a little more democratic and republican. Uh, but that was a slow, progressive battle for a kind of classical, as we now think of it, liberalism in the, the modern world. And then the great American Revolution, we're not going to be under the king anymore. Uh, we're not going to even see our rights as gifts to us by some feudal higher source. They are natural rights of human beings, right, backed up by some sort of a creator, but we are going to be free people. And then the French, with their French Revolution, uh, uh, partly inspired by liberal ideals, partly inspired by more collectivist and socialistic ideals. It's a more complicated case, but nonetheless, feudalism is on its way out with its kind of hierarchical authoritarianism. And that was the front burner battle of the 1700s. 1800s, most clearly, the battle against slavery. And it's astonishing to think that for all of human history, nobody really had a problem on principle with the institution of slavery. They didn't want to be slaves, <laughs> but you know the idea. If uh, you know we lost the battle, in some sense, and uh, you know we become your slaves, well, that's just the way it is, and I might not like it. But of course, if we had won the battle, we would be making slaves of you. There was no principled problem with enslaving human beings until maybe in the 1600s, a few voices, 1700s, more voices, and then institutions start to come into existence in the late 1700s first in America, Britain, and France. Remember those three countries, they're important for the story as I'm going to tell us, uh, to tell it. But then they pick up speed enormously over the course of the 1800s. And it really is astonishing how, again, that was a very ugly battle, the battle to end slavery. But really, within one century, an institution that had been around as long as human beings had been around was largely wiped out of the civilized world, gotten rid of, driven underground into the less civilized parts of the world. Again, that was a great achievement. We won the battle. Going on into the 20th century, two modern malignant forms of collectivism, the totalitarian socialisms come to the fore. National socialism in Germany, extraordinarily vigorous and powerful, almost succeeded in taking over the world right, with its allies and so forth. International communism, Right, another form of socialism, totalitarian also in its aspirations. Uh, at one point, by the time we get to the middle part of the 20th century, almost two-thirds of the world's population, two-thirds of the world's population is living under some sort of totalitarian regime. Very dark days for any sort of understanding of liberalism. And this was the great battle of the 20th century. And again, close, but the liberal side one, we defeated the Nazis, we defeated international communism. So, that's a strong track record. And now into our generation, of course, we are confronted again with some pretty nasty people who are anti-liberal, anti-individualist, and extremely anti-rationalist in all sorts of forms. And once again, our understanding of what a free and decent and civilized society should be is being put to a severe test. 
Now, <clears throat> these are the big three. I do philosophy, which means most of my time is in high abstract theory land, but I love charts, right? and I love data, and I think good philosophy actually integrates high theory with practical empirical data. You need to have the full range of, uh, of, uh, uh, of data and theoretical explanations for a good case. So this is a chart that I love. And when we are talking with people in our generation, in many cases on the left, and they will say that they care about poverty, they care about the underprivileged, they care about the gap between rich and poor, that this is what their political philosophy and everything they are interested in, uh, their activism being based upon, uh, <clears throat> be skeptical. And the reason I wanted to say we should be skeptical about that is for reasons of charts like this. So let me say a little bit about the chart and then come back to the philosophical point about the anti-liberal people who claim to be caring about poverty. So what we have is 2,000 years of human history along the horizontal axis, so it goes back to year one. So in political history, this is Roman Republic transitioning into Roman Empire. In religious history, it's the lifetime of Jesus. And the vertical axis is a measure of productivity in US dollars. It takes the entire world, how much stuff are people making? And what this tells us then is, uh, this is a kind of a scary number because it looks like basically people are making nothing. Uh, if you were to zoom in on this, what you, and you divided people into the richer countries and the poorer countries, on average, uh, richer countries are producing about $400 worth of stuff per person. And since you can only live on what you produce, that means on average, even in the better off places, people are living on about 400 US dollars per year. That is averaged out by the poorer countries where people on average are making a little over $200 per person per year. Put all of that productivity together, uh, it adds up to something not, not very significant. Uh, now, timeline, this is set up for how shocking the improvements in liberal market economies and other uh, sectors of economy. If we were to extend this line back in history another 2,000 years, say the chart was here, 4,000 years, 6,000, 8, 10, if we were to go all the way around, say over to about here, that would be about 30,000 years of human history. That line is flat, close to zero the entire time. Now, 30,000 years, you know, I'm not a math guy, but like, what does that number mean, right? 30,000 years. But that is only about 10% of human history. So when you talk about, or talk to the, rather the anthropologists, they'll say human beings have been around for maybe 300,000 years. So we would have to go around this room 10 times with the chart, and the line is flat, close to zero, human productivity. Now, then we start to get to modernity, around 1500. So this is the era of Michelangelo. It's Columbus crossing the ocean. It's Martin Luther and his theses, uh, and so forth. So we start to see some big revolutions in intellectual and cultural life starting to occur. By the time we get to the 1700s, that's gone up that line actually about 20%. Very short period of time, human beings have increased their productivity by about 20%. That's never happened before in human history in so short a period of time. And then another 150 years, it's gone up another 20%. And then just look at what happens in the last 100 years. It's just skyrockets. Now that is an astonishing, astonishing human accomplishment. And if we were to talk uh, about the divide between rich countries and poor countries, you know, of course the poor countries are also doing very well. The rich countries, if we were just to take the top half, you know, that line would be up on the roof, up to the ceiling. Why did that happen? And when we talk to people who are genuinely interested in issues of wealth and poverty, if they don't know about this chart, 
if they don't have a good explanation for this chart, and if they are saying that our culture doesn't care about the poor or it's poor or it's, it's uh, rough to the poor, and they are educated people stepping forth as intellectuals and academics about how terrible our current society is with respect to the poor and the underprivileged, start to be skeptical because educated people know about this data. And if you are interested in economic issues, genuinely interested in poverty, that's the most important question should be on anyone's mind is, why did that happen? And why did it not happen here or here or anywhere? And then more specifically, so what's, you know, if we get into the 1600s and 1700s, what's going on in the world such that we're going to unleash this amazing human productivity? And then more specifically, educated people who've studied this, they know that it happened not any, just anywhere. It started to happen in England, and then more broadly in Britain. Then it spread to France and then to much of Western Europe, across the Atlantic Ocean to the new countries, especially in North America. Those are the countries that very quickly, right, starting in around here, were already going up, up fast. So why did it happen then, and why did it happen in those particular places? People who are genuinely interested in that issue, that is what they are focusing on trying to understand why we've made the great strides we have, rather than lambasting and criticizing current society in historically uninformed terms. Well, maybe all this wealth is being produced, but who's getting all of the money? Uh, this is another astonishing chart here. This is just the last 200 years of human history, 1820 to now. The vertical axis in this case is the percentage of the world's population living in extreme poverty. Extreme poverty, the number changes according to inflation, of course, uh, every year, but it, it's meant to mean uh, uh, having the enough, enough calories, basically, every day, a certain amount of food security to stay alive, but not much more. So you're, you're living close to death in terms of extreme poverty. 200 years ago, and this is already 50 years after, say, the American Revolution, 60 years after the Industrial Revolution taking off. But uh, 1820, 90% of the world's population living in extreme poverty. And to our modern ears, again, that should sound shocking. What would it mean for 90% of the world to be living in extreme poverty? And again, that had been the norm for human beings. Everybody lived in extreme poverty always. There was a few people, five to 10%, who were somewhat above poverty. Just in 200 years, that number has plummeted until uh, you know, it's down, between, down below 10% of the world's population. Again, why did that happen? And why did it happen first in certain places and not others? Child mortality. Another indicator here, if you want to measure how rich people are, uh, when you have babies, are they going to survive the first year? Until age five, until adulthood. Uh, again, 200 years ago, two out of five babies would die in the first year or within the first five years. And again, that's gone down right, significantly. Sexism, moving away from economic issues. Uh, women being second class, third class citizens. Uh, again, as old as human beings, pretty much every culture in the world. It's only been in the last 200 and now maybe 50 years, the idea that women should have the same liberties and the same rights that males do, and that all of the double standards and arbitrary things that keep women down, something wrong with them and we should do with that. A new idea came into existence. Uh, these are just some American data. Last century, number of women getting uh, higher education degrees, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, law degrees, and so forth. And the trend is upward, and significantly upward, until starting being minorities now, the data all show that a majority of undergraduate degrees and most master's degrees are going to young women right, compared to young men. So if we have people saying we live in a terribly sexist society and so forth, right, and they are making that kind of argument as educated people 
in the absence of knowing data like this, that should raise a question of success. But again, why did that happen? after 300,000 years of human history? And why did it happen again first in some places in the world and not other places in the world? <coughs> Slavery, and we'll get to racism in just a moment. Uh, this is some numbers with respect to slavery. Again, the numbers are scary. About 80% of the world's population were slaves or serfs uh, in the 1700s. And as far as we know, that had been the number for, again, centuries and centuries. Over the course of 200 years, slavery becomes a backwater, uncivilized, underground movement of a minority of people. With respect to racism, right, again, we hear lots of accusations, and often it's an easy accusation, such and such is racist, we live in a racist society, and so forth. This is a survey from about 10 years ago now of attitudes with respect to living, working with, associating with people of different races and how comfortable or not you are. And basically, if you are blue, what that means is 95 to 100% of the people in that area say, I have no problem living, working, associating with people of different races. It's not an issue for me. Uh, the places that then at the other end of the color spectrum, red, those are the places where there is still a significant number of racism. To put this in historical context, if we were to put this chart, if we were able to do those social science 200 years ago, the whole chart would be red. And it would have been red for as long as human beings are around. Again, enormous progress with respect to liberalizing attitudes with respect to race and racial issues. So why did that happen? Now I jump up to what I want to offer as a philosophical explanation for why the great progress occurred on those three issues. And when we are arguing these issues about race, class, privilege, gender, sex, and so forth, the historical record is on our side, broadly speaking, right? in terms of the data. But we also need to have the philosophical arguments. They've been a part of the story, and that's what I want to turn to next. Now, there's the historical era known as the Enlightenment. Often that uh, means the 1700s on the Western calendar. Sometimes it's a generation before and, and a, uh, 1700 and a generation after. Uh, and it is a subset of what we think of historically and philosophically as the modern world. The modern world is the last 500 years or so. Columbus, Michelangelo, Martin Luther, and all of those revolutions, and the, the scientific revolutions, and, and so on. It really has been uh, an astonishing 500 years for, for human history. But I want to put some flesh on those theoretical, theoretical bones. When you take <clears throat> history courses and they talk about modernity, they all talk about Columbus and Michelangelo and Martin Luther and so forth. If you talk to philosophers about modernity, they will say Rene Descartes was the father of modern philosophy, right? Or those of us in the minority, Francis Bacon was the father of modern philosophy. Mm -hmm. And these guys are giants and they're absolutely important because they did inaugurate a philosophical revolution and they won in the early part of the 1600s. Intellectual authoritarianism, the idea that the individual's reason is not competent or to be trusted, that it needs to be suborned or under some sort of higher intellectual authority, right? and or that one should believe things for non-rational reasons, faith and or mystical insights. Those ideas, again, around for a long time in human history were challenged, challenged successfully, and overthrown by the fathers of modern philosophy. It was an epistemological revolution. Now notice the dates here. Early 1600s, and that's going to be important as well. 1620 for Bacon's first publication. 1640s for Rene Descartes' publications. More significantly or more sophisticatedly, John Locke in the latter part of the 1600s. So it's an intellectual revolution in philosophy that occurs in the 1600s. And when we start to say human beings are most importantly rational, creatures of reason, Everything changes, and all of these subsequent revolutions in science, in religion, in economics, in politics, relations between men and women are transformed 
over the course of the next two centuries based on this intellectual revolution. Now, the one that's uh, most easy to see uh, and is more traveled territory is saying, well, if we are rational, then we should be able to understand the world by applying our reason to the way the world works. And it's then in the 1600s that you see all of the modern branches of science being laid, their foundations, right, in anatomy, in astronomy, in chemistry, in physics, until we get mature statements uh, by the end of the 1600s in Isaac Newton laying the foundation for, for, for modern, modern physics. The idea then that we can take that science and that scientific mindset and apply it to human beings who are very complicated. Modern medicine is being put on a scientific footing as we get into the 1700s. And it's a long time, another 100 years, because it is complicated. But we can then see uh, human anatomy, human physiology, surgical treatments, uh, Edward Jenner and the first immunology uh, all coming on board again. So the track from the intellectual revolution by the philosophers to the scientific revolution to the revolutions in modern medicine, that's maybe 160, 170 years. Astonishing improvement. We take that same scientific mindset and we apply it to inanimate objects. Can we make and remake things and become inventive and innovative and do technologies? And an enormous amount of inventiveness with respect to mechanical things started to occur. You know, human beings have been inventive, but nothing on the scale that started to occur in the 1600s and on into the 1700s, culminating in what the historians will rightly describe as the Industrial Revolution. And it was a revolution. Suddenly we can make machines that can make all sorts of stuff, huge amounts of stuff, scientifically applying it to mechanical production. And of course, the science and the engineering producing enough large-scale energy so we can power all of those machines as well. Never had that happened before in human history. So this other side of the divide, though, is to say if we focus on reason and see that human beings are reasonable, well, who has this reason? And very optimistically in the 1600s, the idea was that every human being has the capacity for reason. It's not the province of an elite few people whom the rest of us then have to trust and do what they say. Everyone has a brain. They can learn how to use it with good education, and that's what we should be doing. The individual mind becomes of fundamental importance to being a dignified human being. And you see by the end of the 1600s the idea of moral individualism. Again, a revolutionary concept. There had been some people with some individualistic ideas here and there, but as a comprehensive philosophical program, and the idea that we need to respect the individual and his or her own responsibility for their thinking and beliefs is, uh, 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 I've got John Locke here because he's probably the most famous exponent of this in the 1690s. Now, if you think that individuals are morally responsible for their own thinking, and that reason, properly trained, is this competent faculty that basically everyone shares. That has huge implications for politics. Because then, and you start to see the rise of democratic, and again, Republican forms of political activism being widespread in the 1700s, and then the consequent revolutions. They say, well, maybe we can take this democracy idea and the idea that every individual should be a free, self-governing person the way the Republicans typically will emphasize seriously. You're not going to do that if you think that most people are irrational or that whatever degree of reason they have is incompetent really to figure out things in life. You're not going to give them a say in important political matters unless you have great confidence in the widespread power of individual reason. And that's in another great accomplishment of the Enlightenment. And the same thing in the economic sphere, the idea that we're going to leave people free to make their own decisions about what their jobs are going to be, how they're going to make a living, what they're going to sell for, deal with people in business in uh, other parts of the world, and be self-governing as producers and consumers and traders, that we can trust people to do all of that. Again, it requires enormous confidence in the power of reason widely distributed. So market economies as a valuable system uh, starts to become 
uh, uh, prominent again by the 1700s. Now, what's interesting about the dates here is that they're all in the 1700s with the possible exception of 1688 in England. And that all of those revolutions, political revolutions, the free market revolution, right, the religious separation of church and state revolution, the scientific revolutions, they occur for the first time in human history because of the earlier philosophical revolution in the 1600s. It's philosophy being put into practice. Philosophy is making a life or death difference. And as a result of that, right, the idea that we can become healthier, that we can become wealthier, that we have more stuff, that we can all be richer, that we can basically figure out anything we want to about how the world works, that enormous optimism that is characteristic of the Enlightenment. Again, for the first time in human history, right, people had that outlook, that philosophical optimism. We have become enlightened, hence the name. And finally, ignorance and superstition and short life stands and pain and misery and intolerance and hatred among human beings as the norm. We can put all of that behind us and create this beautiful new world. We should be happy and progressive. Now that's astonishing to me, and I've studied this stuff for a lot of years, and it's astonishing to me how quickly it occurred, but it's certainly uh, as someone whose life is in philosophy, I love seeing the practical implications of very abstract philosophical arguments being put into practice. So if people are interested in sexism, interested in privilege, interested in racism, the first historical lesson is to say, if you really are serious about those things, you should be a great fan of the Enlightenment. It has been the most successful anti-sexist, anti-racist, anti arbitrary privilege program in human history. Nothing has ever come close to it. And it's been an enormous success in the last couple of centuries. And we are the heirs and inheritors of that. And it's one of the great uh, benefits we get just from being born in the times that we are living in. Now, principal philosopher, I want to just abstract three things here. Those Historical accomplishments do require a widespread commitment to rationality on principle, a widespread commitment to individualism on principle, and a widespread commitment socially to the idea that we should, with goodwill, be able to work out mutually beneficial relations in all areas of life. And if we can't, well, you know, you just go do your thing, I'm going to go do my thing, we'll tolerate going our separate ways. Those philosophical ideas have to be argued and defended by the intellectuals, and they have to become widespread cultural currency. Then and only then in human history do we get the practical benefits of the lessening of all of those arbitrary sexisms and racisms and so forth that have held human beings back. Now, ooh, that looks uglier than I thought when I was on my, uh, on my screen. <laughs> I could think, ooh, that's an interesting font. <laughs> but when we look at our philosophical adversaries, and I'm here I'm going to be focusing on the woke left, not because they're our only philosophical adversary, but these are the ones that are most well-placed in higher education and in the, uh, 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 the education space where I spend most of my time. What is fascinating then about them is that all of them will say they are anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-privilege. But that gets packaged with a complete disinterest in any sort of rational debate about the issues. So the practical implications of political correctness, cancel culture, and all of the nastiness that goes with respect, uh, with not doing anything civilized. Rather than focusing on the individual, they submerge the individual into various kinds of collectivized identities. What's the most important thing about their own selves is not things that they have chosen or accomplished as individuals. It is their gender group identity or their racial group identity or their ethnic group identity. And the same thing with respect to you when they deal with you. They're not interested in you as an individual. They want to know your group identities and they have then ready-made 
ways of talking and behaving with respect to you depending on what your group identity is. They're anti-individualistic. And then with respect to how we're going to do things socially, uh, no liberalism <laughs> there in any genuine sense. Very quick, imposed solutions uh, and imposed by force, if possible, solutions. And even if it's not an overtly political context, entering into social relationships with this hostile adversarial stance. They come into the debate or come into the discussion not liking you and making it clear that they don't like you and that they don't expect you to like and they're going to treat you with a certain measure of hostility. Now that's the description of the activists, but behind the activism again is philosophy. And it's an important set of philosophies that have been developed again over the course of some centuries here. And what's interesting is that the label, the self-ascribed label for that movement, intellectual movement, is postmodernism, And they are choosing that explicitly with the idea that we know what the modern world is all about the last 500 years or so. You know, that it stands for reason and individualism and free markets and all of this stuff like that. But our position is that the entire modern world is a mistake and or that it was an unintended set of false beliefs that when they were put into practice has led to disaster, this terribly racist, sexist, and hating of the poor society that we live in and that we're all going to blow ourselves up. This jaded view is that modernism caused all of that. We need to recognize from their perspective that it is intellectually bankrupt and or intellectually corrupt that it has led to this terrible society that we live in. So we need to put all of that in brackets and go post, go after, go to something else beyond the entire modern and enlightenment framework. The intellectuals are explicit about this. So let me just give you a couple of examples. I gave this chart earlier. Reason, science, individualism, uh, you know, they're anti-liberal, they hate free market capitalism, they're suspicious of the products of science and technology. You know, how many times have you read recently that science is a white European construct, right? Or right, medicine, right, is, right, again, racially constructed by males of a certain uh, construction. So therefore, it can be dismissed. So all of the big things here, uh, and then again, not very much interested in the idea that we're in a progress-making society, a lot of cynicism. Some big names, I don't know if you are aware of these guys, but they are worth uh, checklisting at least a little bit. Michel Foucault, the most famous of the postmoderns, um, <clears throat> not uncoincidentally, you know, he joined the French Communist Party in the 1950s for a few years. In the 1960s, he declared himself a Maoist, greatly admiring what Mao was doing in China. In the 1970s, when there was the Islamic theocratic revolution going on, uh, hated the United States and was saying, yes, the Ayatollahs are you know, taking things in the right kind of direction and so forth. So there's the political side of this, but he was a PhD in philosophy and he was doing his work in epistemology and the psychology of epistemology at one of the best universities in Europe. He is cutting edge philosophy in the middle part of the 20th century, which was at a very skeptical phase. All of the major philosophical programs were reaching dead ends and confessing a certain level of failure. And the postmoderns are making the argument that all these arguments about reason and scientific method and how we can figure out truth and be objective right, and gain genuine knowledge, all of that is bankrupt. Those philosophers have been busy undermining every element of sophisticated scientific method and not finding good answers to replace them with. Now, that's a historical footnote that needs to be filled out in terms of the, the literature, but this is just a, one quote grab here from one of Foucault's most famous books, Reason, what about reason? It's the ultimate language of madness. And one of the characteristics of postmodern rhetoric is the idea of uh, trying to build in some paradoxical formulations if you possibly can. Because, and this is what we've been taught by enlightenment thinkers, reason and madness are opposed to each other. But the argument here is that there is no distinction between people who think they are sane 
and people who think they are insane. The idea of being insane, right, on the rational position is to say that your mind is out of touch with reality. There's no connection there. The sane people are the ones who have that objective connection still in place. Their minds are in contact with reality. But if the philosophers are right, the skeptical philosophers Foucault has read and is challenging, there is no way of showing that your mind is in connection with reality. We are all subjective and out of touch with reality, and there are just different forms of subjectivity out there with the so-called insane people just being one other variation on the spectrum that's possible. Another famous postmodern, just another name check, Jean-Francois Lyotard, put him here partly for this quotation, but also he is the postmodern who gave the name postmodernism to the movement, talking about the postmodern condition being skeptical about narratives and merit, meta-narratives and uh, not setting aside truth as a useful concept that objectivity also is an ancient concept. So if we are rational, we say we are rational, the argument here is going to be, because we have the facts, we have the truth, we have the data, we have the logic on our side. Um, <clears throat> if it's the case, though, that the philosophers have been teaching us that there is no such thing as truth, or objectivity, but nonetheless people use this language of reason. Why are they doing that? And the argument here is that it's just one more power play. Some people like to control you right, by means of overt uh, uh, physical controls or political controls right, or playing certain kinds of psychological mind games with you. And people who claim that they are rational and just using facts and logic and so forth are just playing another social power game. So everybody has their own subjective values. None of them are objective. We're all in this adversarial struggle with each other. Some people are just very good at using language in an apparently rational way to try to get you onto their value agenda. It's a power struggle. It's a power play because everything just is a conflictual power struggle. So this is the philosophical territory. Now, there's this guy. Yes, okay. I'm not going to say very much about him. There's one of the uh, you know, kind of the prominent understandings right, of postmodernism, and I've written about this, is that the interesting thing is that uh, in the first generation, all of them are leftists. Uh, not just leftists, they're all very far left, very far left. And that's not accidental, but I don't have time for that today. Second generation, also, all of the major postmoderns are leftist and pretty far leftist as well. Now, things have changed a little in our generation because this postmodern set of skeptical tools and relativity and power play language is starting to be adopted by other parts of the political spectrum as well. So it's getting more complicated. But there is an interesting connection here to this guy because we have to say you, know, you need to understand your Marx theory uh, to understand where the postmoderns and the woke are coming from. Now, the, the common phrase is to say it's uh, neo-Marxism. I would say use that term very sparingly and only after you've done a certain amount of homework on it because Marxism is a very big tent. There are lots and lots of different neo-Marxisms. It's also important that Marx was writing 150 years ago, and Marxism has evolved in a lot of different ways, so probably more accurately, any contemporary version has to be something like you neo-neo-neo-neo-neo know, neo, 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 neo Marxism. Right? And that's a lot of right on fleshing. So uh, be careful with throwing that particular label out there. Nonetheless, it is true to say that as a demographic point, people who are in this woke adversarial pushing a certain line with respect to race, class, and gender are coming from the broadly big tent left part of the political spectrum. Now, this is uh, just a little plug for my own book here, but this is the chart just showing some of the evolutions of Marxism over the course of the last 150 years. And I would say the postmodern woke people, if we use that label, they're coming out of this particular branch right here, and there's more that needs to be said at that point. Point just is the territory is, is complicated. Now, <clears throat> the philosophical content, the political content, the particular issues that are being debated, race, class, and gender, and what's the right theory, and what's the right 
uh, set of, uh, of, uh, of activist steps to solve the particular problems and so on. All of that is on the content side. And we can have, of course, lots of arguments about what the right understanding of racism and sexism and so forth are. But for today, I want to focus more on method issues, just in this closing set of, of remarks. Because one of the things that people on our side of the debate struggle with is not just the idea that people have different theories about race, class, gender, how the economy works, historical theories, and so forth. We are comfortable with that idea that there's lots of different content positions that are out there. But what we struggle with is the postmoderns and their second generation applications that they don't deal with those issues the same way we deal with them. That the issue of reason and rationality is fundamental, not only for coming up with the right content, but also with the methods. And most of us have been schooled as a result of being children or grandchildren of the Enlightenment with the idea that facts matter, evidence matters, data matters. Coming up with a hypothesis and being willing to have your hypothesis tested and challenged. And then all of the social institutions that go along with that. If we're going to do it in a public way, that we're going to do education a certain way, that teachers aren't just going to be indoctrinating their students with their particular dogma. They're going to train their students to think for themselves. That we're going to have academic freedom as an institution. That we're going to have debates and that when we discuss with each other on social media, we're going to be civil and not engage in certain sorts of logical fallacies like appeals to authority and ad hominem and so forth that we're going to try to define all of our terms clearly. And all of those methodological points are second nature to most of us as children and grandchildren of the Enlightenment. And the frustrating thing is that the postmoderns and the applied postmoderns do not accept any of that. And so the methods they bring to what they see as this conflict are very different methods. And in many cases, they are methods that are designed to subvert your expectations that facts, objectivity, rationality, civility matter. It's a different methodological universe that they are coming out of. And that is important to understand. So what I want to do is say that <clears throat> just in the course of my lifetime, when you go from high theory postmodernism, which did amount an intellectual revolution, significantly successful in much of higher education, 50 to 60 years ago, and for you young people that seems like ancient history, but that took root and it developed over the course of the next 50 or 60 years, and that is why we have the contours of discussion and anti-discussion that we do right now. So what I want to do is just follow one line of development here, starting with of being anti-reason in the sense of seeing that reason is not competent to come to know reality. And that is skepticism, if you generalize it. Can we, by means of our rational capacities, looking at the evidence, logic, double checking, and so forth, come to know reality? And the skeptic answer is no, we can't, we can never know. Knowledge is ultimately an empty concept, it's just a word and perhaps we should set it aside, and that's what the postmoderns do. They say it's, it's a meaningless concept, we should, uh, we should not be using it. So a robust philosophical skepticism, such as we find quite current in the 1950s and 1960s, what is this going to imply if you take that seriously? Now the first move, <clears throat> and this is the one that you see fairly widespread among young intellectually and educated people in the 1960s who say, okay, look, nobody really knows anything. There is no such thing as truth. There's just all of these different styles of life, all of these different cultures, and they have their way of looking at the world and their value system, but no one of them is right, and none of them can be shown to be right. That's the skepticism part. So what we should do is all be groovy, right, to use that 1960s hippie language, and just accept all of these differences and be tolerant that everybody has their own way of understanding and feeling and thinking about the world. Because we don't want to say that mine is better than yours and that therefore I have the right to put my 
worldview on you. So we should just say there's all these different cultures. We live in this multicultural world, and we should all learn to be tolerant of each other. And if we're more ambitious, maybe what we should do is try to step outside of our own culture and embrace another culture. So take a pilgrimage to Nepal, yes, and try to understand the higher world, or go to Africa or some such place. Right? Very quickly, though, by the time we get to the 1970s, that was seen as an impossibility. There is no way. Right? Isn't that perfect? You did that on yes, I did. <laughs> But also, it's uh, used internationally. So you guys have a certain reputation in this part of the world. <laughs> that it's impossible to uh, understand somebody else's value framework or their way of looking at the world. We're all trapped in our own cultural subjectivities. And so uh, we should not try to you know, intersect with each other. We should just go our separate ways. And of course, we're going to think that our way is better than your way. So you have an isolation of people into different groups very widespread in the 1970s intellectual life. But then <clears throat> what makes life meaningful is having some sort of framework that you are strongly committed to. And if you believe that uh, uh, you can't give an objective or rational grounding to it, the thing that you just need to do is make this subjective strong commitment to whatever your group's values happen to be. And so out of that was a firing up of, rather than just you know, being relaxed and groovy or just going our own separate ways, what you need to do is make a strong commitment to your group's way of doing things and then enter into the fray on behalf of that. And that starts to percolate strongly by the time we get into the 1980s in higher education. You notice the obvious thing here. If people are making all kinds of subjective commitments to all sorts of things. Uh, they all conflict with each other. But that gets combined with the idea that there is no rational, objective way to resolve any of these differences. The skepticism has undercut all of that. So how are we going to resolve all of these? Power. Everything is just a power struggle. Now, the uh, data point I would throw out here is by the time you get to the 1990s in higher education in the curriculum wars, the saying chanted by student activist group, hey, ho, Western Civ has got to go. We've got to get rid of Western civilization in the elite Western universities, student groups and activist faculty chanting this. Now, this is not just to say nobody knows everything and we should be peaceful and groovy, or that we should try to understand each other, or that we just all go our separate ways. Instead, it's we have our agenda. It conflicts with your agenda. We are making a subjective commitment to ours. There is no way for us rationally or peacefully to resolve this conflict, so I have to get rid of yours. And that's where things were in the 1990s. Most of you, I'm hoping, were born around 2000, so that means you were born into this intellectual climate. And then when things got applied to race, class, and gender, it was this framework that is put into play. This is the operative methodological principle. So we're debating race, class, and gender. But what we have is two completely different philosophies in collision over those particular issues. Those are the issues of our generation. The moderns and the Enlightenment thinkers advocating this. The postmoderns and their woke activists advocating this. It's a philosophical battle in collision. But well, that's what we've been doing as fighters for a liberty society for five or six hundred years. This is our new challenge. Do I have five minutes? OK. I want to end with some happy news. <laughs> because I am cautiously optimistic. I do think that we will win this current cultural battle. And I think there are some signs that the tide is turning, because some very smart intellectuals have been reasserting and reinvigorating the Enlightenment program. Right, broadly speaking, and I'm hoping that all of you will be right, a part of this. But the Enlightenment and modern philosophy, for all of its flaws and all of their weaknesses, and two steps forward, one step back, and so forth, has been an astonishing success in a short period of human, human history. 
I just want to give you three quick charts to show you what this is. So this is income per person. This is a GDP. It's adjusted for purchasing power parity, inflation adjusted, and so forth. The important thing also is to notice this is a logarithmic scale. So we go from this amount of space being 1,000 years, then half the amount of space uh, uh, doubles, and then it doubles, doubles again, and so forth. That's so that the chart doesn't get too long. One measure of success uh, uh, on the vertical axis is life expectancy at birth. And we know that life expectancy has gone up significantly. This is the year 1812. One, there's uh, about 180 dots here, or circles. Each one represents a different country in the world. And they are color-coded for different parts of the world. So red is Asia. These dark blue, that's Africa. This, this is supposed to be like a pumpkin orange color. Those are the European nations. The yellows are the Americas. And big circle means big population, small circle, small population. So it's, uh, it's an impressive amount of information. What this tells us, though, is when we plot every single country in the world in the year 1812, that uh, the richest country in the world, people are making maybe $2,000 or $2,800 US dollars per person per year. And average life expectancy is just over 40. And actually, it was probably about 43 for women, 39 to 44 males. There's always that two to three year age gap. Uh, what is that country? Anyone know? That is England, the first nation of the Enlightenment, liberal democratic politics, industrial revolution, religious tolerance, and so forth. This one is the United States. I'm from Canada originally, so we always have to find Canada. This is Canada, right? Smaller. Uh, and then uh, this is France. Okay. So we have England, France, and the United States, those are the countries doing the best in the world as a result of, by 1812, instantiating some measure of enlightenment philosophy. The average, though, this is China. Probably take China as the average. Average person living on maybe $900 per year and life expectancy in the low 30s. Okay. I'm going to advance 100 years. See what the chart looks like. 1912. This is what happens. Uh, United States, huge. Population gone up, and so it goes from here to there. That's uh, England, France, Germany is joining, and all of these are the Western European nations, Eastern European nations. Nothing happening yet in Africa, nothing happening yet in East Asia and South Asia. These are the places of the Enlightenment. Europe, North America, and then some places in the world where it has been spread. I'm going to jump 100 years more. This will be to 2012, when most of you, I assume, were young teenagers or maybe not quite then. This is the world in 2012. All the same countries. Uh, <clears throat> and the numbers are impressive. So there's the United States, about 40,000 per person. But look at life expectancy, more than doubled. So not only having a huge amount of wealth, but twice as much time to live your life. Astonishing accomplishment. And the thing that I like to uh, note, I don't think I did it here, but if you were to go back to 1812, notice where all of the countries are in the world. They're all in this lower left quadrant. Within 200 years, blink of an eye in human history, there's nobody there anymore. We've taken the entire world and lifted it out of poverty and doubled life expectancy, that is a great testament to the power of philosophy, the right philosophy applied to human affairs. And of course, when we are now dealing with our philosophical adversaries right, who say the Enlightenment and modern philosophy was a giant mistake and it's all wrong and we need to jettison the entire project and go in a completely different direction. And not only that, we think that you are bad people for believing, yes, in Enlightenment philosophy. Uh, recognize that we need to be fighting both the philosophical battle, but also see the data as on your side. Become familiar with the data and use it when appropriate. All right, thanks for your attention. Stop here.
All right, Q and A, uh, sir. When I talk to young people who are sympathetic to postmodernism, or even generally speaking, left-leaning, they seem to be attracted to them because they identify some sort of problem which exists in society, and they don't really focus on what the, the, solu the so-called solution that they're suggesting. But they're yes. kind of, uh, I guess, averse to the right because the right says, "Well, the people on the left have identified this problem, and they." suggest a solution that is so radical that mm. we just deny that there's a problem, mm. deny that this thing exists. And I think that's what like partly one of the reasons why postmodernism generally speaking came about. Like from what I understand, it came about as a reaction against like the male, white, hetero hegemony within academia. And of course they are completely wrong about language and about reason and everything else. But, I mean, you brought up the example of like how medicine is a white male construction, but I think that to put it in that way is a bit of context dropping because it, like I, I have read Foucault's, I guess, paragraphs on that, and he brings examples of how in the past we used to test medicines only on white males and different treatments only on white males. And there are biological and psychological differences between races and sexes. And I think some of the concerns that they bring up are legitimate. And I don't know how productive it is for us or like people on the right to just dismiss the entire thing. Mm. So I wonder with postmodernists and specifically with young people who are just sympathetic to it, should we just dismiss them because they're interested in this? Yeah. So that's an uh, interesting, rich set of observations. So I think you're right as a demographic point. Younger people often are attracted to postmodernism. Uh, and one of the reasons why is that postmodernism is offering a new kind of set of solutions. That in many cases, they will be the ones who say, here's a problem. Uh, this is a real problem. We need to pay attention to it. And here are the solutions. And to some extent, that's a justifiable reaction uh, because people on the other parts of the political spectrum have gotten complacent. They will say, well, we've basically solved all of the problems. We can go on. So the energy, has, in some cases, has shifted culturally to that part of, the, part of the spectrum. I would say also, in many cases, younger people don't know the history. And so they don't have a context within which to evaluate how much progress we have made, whether these other proposed solutions are, are in the gambit or if they're just pie in the sky right, and, and so forth. Uh, I would say also, though, on the other point about Foucault, uh, Foucault is, in some respects, in my reading, the most sympathetic of the postmoderns, because in some cases, uh, he does come across as a kind of libertarian type of guy who is very suspicious of power structures and various kinds of abuses of power. And that certainly resonates right, with, uh, with, uh, with, with people of liberal persuasion, using that in the classical sense. Uh, and so it is also is true that just in the years before Foucault's death, he started to be a little more friendly towards some of the, the big classical liberal thinkers, saying that we should you know, maybe pay attention to Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek because they did a lot better or predicting the 20th century than people on the left and so on. So I think there can be reasons there. So my deepest response to that, though, would be as a philosopher to say that when you push on Foucault, Right, he's not simply saying, as classical liberals would say, uh, we are inheritors of all sorts of arbitrary, irrational prejudices from the history. And some of them really are still with us in the 1800s and 1900s and on even into the 2000s. He's not merely saying that we have those and we need to be vigilant and, uh, and take them up and do something about them. All of that classical liberals are entirely on board with and, and advocates of the Enlightenment. He's actually going stronger and saying that the reason why these other groups weren't paying attention to was because they, we didn't care about them. And uh, that, that modern philosophy was deeply racist and had the structural racism embedded in them such that they were epistemologically opaque to other cultures, other races, and so forth. And so I think that is a historical misreading. And it's also a philosophical mistake that is not well motivated because he does have some political agendas at work. So short answer would be to say, I think in many cases, people who are young people, if they're initially attracted to postmodernism, 
for the most part, it's because they really are modernists and liberals. They say, look, this is a problem. And damn it, that, that problem, we should have been able to solve that problem. We should do about that. But that's a very modern attitude right toward, toward the world. OK, but more needs to be said about that. Good set of questions. Others? Ah, yes. Mr. Stanley, thank you very much for the interesting lecture. Your intellectual writings played a big role in my development while I was studying on my BA program in social sciences. Especially, I was inspired by your book about explaining postmodernism to your own nation. My question is also about postmodern reality. According to my observation, the modern world is quite um, diverse and complex. There are many political ideas that coexist in a complicated relationship, but this conflict does not ultimately lead to a massive uh, change that will lead to a change in the entire system. Uh, I am interested in your case as to how long such a political structure will last and what processes are necessary for the postmodern era to move to the next stage. And also I am interested in what is the next stage after postmodern yeah, wow. <clears throat> okay, so how long will it take us, if I can brief us, to uh, get past postmodernism and what will come next? Is that fair? Okay. Uh, one of the interesting things is the rate of change of intellectual and cultural movements has been accelerating in the modern world for all of the obvious reasons about mobility and transportation communities and the professionalization and democratization of intellectual life. So things happen a lot faster. Uh, and I would say it's interesting how it took two or three centuries for modern philosophy to mature into the Enlightenment, and then another century or more for the cultural revolutions to take place. So we're talking about a three century span. Postmodernism, uh, intellectually, it developed in two generations. That's like 50 years. And then already in the course of you know, my lifetime and your lifetime, we have seen it start to institutionalize and start to uh, revolutionize some subsectors of culture. So the pace is much quicker. So uh, I don't know, though, that I can give you a precise answer to how much longer we will be in this phase, because human beings have free will. And it depends on what uh, uh, ideas we decide to believe, how effective we are at getting our act together philosophically, forming movements that are cohesive and have good marketing and communication. And none of that can be predicted, and none of that is deterministic. What I would say, though, is this is just is that I am cautiously optimistic because uh, uh, I wrote my book on postmodernism uh, almost 25 years ago, and I was hoping it would not become a prediction manual. Right? The idea was here's the problems and this is where we could go. And higher academics did follow that path right, much more significantly, and it has spilled out into, into the culture. And it did seem like for much of uh, the first uh, 15 years or so, that there was not very much being done at all, even awareness inside of academic life about the problems, uh, uh, and, and, and then not much uh, awareness outside of academic life as well. But what I am optimistic about is that by the time we get to about the year 2015, suddenly a lot of people are aware that we have a big problem on our hands. A lot of very good people inside the higher academic world and in the broader cultural space. And in just five to seven years, eight years, there's been a vigorous, widespread cultural education about, I mean, everybody knows about woke and is arguing about all of these issues. We have you know, literally a billion people in the planet engaged in these arguments and discussions. And a lot of uh, effective pushback is going on. So I am optimistic that uh, now that we are aware what the issues are and we are becoming more mobilized uh, we can get to post postmodernism within a generation. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. So, uh, my question is the following: Why didn't people embrace capitalism, and why didn't wasn't it dominating until uh, and Brain started talking about it? I read her opinion on this, but I also love to know the Yes. So the question is: Why is this thing working even? Or am I just holding it up as a prop? Yeah. <laughs> is it doing anything? No? OK, I'm going to get it. They just gave it to me, so I guess I should uh, test these things for myself, huh? 
That's right. So uh, history of capitalism uh, and why more people aren't capitalists. Okay, now that, that's, a, that's a good question. And then you mentioned Rand as uh, obviously a giant yes, of the 20th century. Yes, because as capitalism formally like, was established in the 18th century, yes. uh, but it wasn't that dominating until Ayn Rand started talking about it and saying that it's the only moral system that people can embrace. Right. So as we see, a lot of innovations, a lot of changes yeah. happen after Ayn Rand talked about it. So why is this a twist? Yes. Uh, so again, a little bit of history. I would say <clears throat> if you go back 1700s, uh, the entire world is tribal or feudal. Right? And then a series of revolutions, feudalism goes away very quickly. Then the modern debate becomes what do we replace feudalism with? And interestingly, the two schools of thought that came said that the most important social and therefore political values should be liberty and equality. And everybody was on board with that. That the problem with feudalism was that people were not free, they were stuck in their classes and not allowed, and that the different classes were unequal. They had different rights, privileges, and, and so forth. So liberty and equality. But then the big debate is, well, which of those two has priority? Do you say freedom comes first, in which case, you're going to be comfortable with the idea. Some people are going to say, just to focus on capitalistic issues, more money than other people, and so therefore be unequal in an economic sense. But you're fine with that because liberty is the more important value. On the other side, equality, again, used in a lot of different ways, wants to say, no, the problem with feudalism was that people were not equally getting a share of society's resources. Now, there was already less individualism, more collectivism built into this program that all of the resources belong to society and we should all share them equally. And then we can talk about people being freer once we have established a certain equality baseline. So that's a, 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 a lot of words to say. Basically, we had capitalism economically and socialism as the two modern economic, under, economic philosophies that come to the fore. Now, I do want to say, though, I think that capitalism was the greater success story for much of the uh, late 1700s and 1800s. So Adam Smith mm -hmm. and David Ricardo and some of the first classical liberals in their, their early understanding, they were enormously influential and enormously effective. And capitalist, broadly a capitalist economies uh, uh, were, were doing quite well. Socialism was in the mix and there were lots of versions of socialism on through the 1800s, but they weren't practiced as much as I would say capitalist economies were and the theory of socialism was not worked out with nearly the degree of sophistication as capitalist economics, economics in, the, in the 1800s. But things did change in the 20th century. And I think that's largely because of uh, Lenin and Stalin, and they mounted a successful socialist revolution in communism. And then so all of the various schools of socialism then had a single success story to rally around. And then for other philosophical reasons, the collectivism, certain kinds of, uh, of altruism, uh, and then just the like of power politically, uh, that version of socialism uh, became extremely ascendant in the 20th century, and then capitalist theory did decline. Uh, now, Rand is hugely, hugely important for uh, reinvigorating the case for capitalism in the middle and latter part of the 20th century, but we do also need to give credit to Ludwig von Mises, in the generation before, uh, who was also equally tireless, less philosophical and more focused on the economics, less focused on the moral, moral issues, more focused on making the practical utilitarian case for, for capitalism. But there were other capitalist uh, theoreticians. Hayek, I'm not a huge fan of Hayek philosophically, but he does have some very good stuff with respect to philosophy of law, and of course his economics is, uh, is first rate as well. And then Milton Friedman, a different philosophical school. Again, I'm not you know, super on board with a lot of his philosophical, but again, a first-rate practical economist. So uh, there was then uh, a significant number of first-rate people in the 20th century, but they were 
uh, as you suggest, in the minority, and that is an intellectual puzzle to be, uh, to be sorted out. I do want to say part of it is that uh, the collectivism has still been strong in, in, into the modern world. Altruism of certain sorts, there's a varieties of altruism out there, still very strong. The idea of power and the seduction of political power, uh, there's in every generation people who just like to control and run things, uh, and so liberal, democratic, and republican checks on political power goes against the grain against them. So it's a mixture of, I think, philosophical plus traditional psychological reasons. Probably the most important historical event, though, was that uh, the, the Soviet Union came into existence and it was just enormously energizing to the far left. And uh, this ties into your point about the cultural battle shifting. It, it seemed like that's the wave of the future and that's where all of the action is. So. Yes. Well, thank you for your great lecture. I really enjoyed it. Thank I you. have one commentary about uh, your uh, you're speaking about woke culture that you said uh, that it's part of collectivism. Well, I personally disagree about that. Actually, I think it's mostly some weird mixture of collectivism and uh, individualism overload. Uh, sort of individualism overload? Overload, yeah. Like, for example... Oh, so I have too much individualism? Yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, let me explain. For example, uh, recently I watched a YouTube video about the Hollywood couple. Uh, they are like normal biological male and biological female. Yes. Yeah, but they uh, find themselves uh, non-binary, both of them, yes. so they are queer couple. Uh, in that case, I think it's part life of uh, individualism in that uh, form that uh, if I think that, let's say I'm a tree, that is my individual opinion that I'm a tree and no one can say Got anything, it. it's my human right to be, or, <laughs> or, or it's not human, not, it's my tree right to be a tree. <laughs> Are you a racist tree? Uh, <laughs> I hope I'm not. <laughs> But uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, one of the problems, actually, although I think that postmodern philosophy can be a weapon uh, of that, because that's also some kind of reason that's not sensible. Yeah. No, I think your uh, your position is is correct, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I there, don't yeah, think the, that I have a tree. No, no, I got that part. <laughs> yeah, that was just a working example. Yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, the more uh, fundamental point is going to be uh, not just the collectivism, but also the skepticism. And the skepticism is going to then generate subjectivism. So if we don't objectively know the truth, then I as the subject can just kind of make up my own truth. And there is a fork in the road within schools of subjectivism. Some of them go in a collectivistic direction to say, uh, therefore, my mind and my, my knowledge and my values are going to be formed by my social circumstances. And those will be collectivized than versions of skeptical subjectivism. But there is another tradition that will say, uh, uh, my mind is uh, its own power, metaphysically, so to speak. And so it does not have any connection to reality. Instead, it generates its own world. It generates its own values in an entirely individual subjectivistic way. And I think this is the type of movement that you are talking about philosophically. So then, uh, the idea that there's an objective biology that's a fundamental constraint that I need to work within, well, that's just one other thing that I, with my uh, subjective uh, metaphysical power, can choose to ignore. Now, the philosophical root for this in the 20th century is going to be existentialism. More particularly, someone like Jean-Paul Sartre with his famous phrase, uh, existence precedes essence. And that is, uh, at least in the, the first part of that, the, the famous essay where he talks about that, where he does, he does want to say that he, when you are born as a human being, you have no essence, right? Or in our language, you have no identity. There is no such thing as a you, or that you have a human nature that you need to work within. Instead, it's all a matter of subjective commitments and decisions that you as an individual make, that you create your identity and create your own essence. So that is coming out of a skeptical place, uh, but it's going in an individualist direction. And there are some versions of the woke 
uh, that are much more individualistic in that sense. I can just you know, make up whatever I want. I'm not collectively right, uh, organized. So yes, All right, absolutely. Yes. Uh, I'm thinking about people's work, and I would like to comment on it. I think these ideas are going to place more. And he actually said that this is like the most important thing that we can do to make the world a better place. Yes. So uh, I think that combination or that comment combines uh, Foucault as kind of a historian sociologist with as a as a philosopher as well. So on the, the first claim, the, one of, he does make this historical claim. He calls it archaeological claim to say that the movement of the modern world has been to or in the direction of increasing, dividing people into groups so that the powerful group can marginalize and disempower all of the other groups. And that's a historical claim about how development has gone. Now, as a historian, I would say that that's exactly wrong. The history of the modern world has been exactly the opposite of that. It has been to say that, to go in the direction of saying, different groups of people, we are bringing them into the fold. So it's not the case that there's a small group of people who have the capacity for reason Instead, that then gets extended to uh, women. It gets extended to uh, uh, people of other races, people of other ethnicities, until it becomes completely universal. Uh, the idea that human beings are individuals with their own moral agency. You can see it, 1600s, 1700s, 80s. More and more people are brought into that group as having uh, uh, moral agency as a universal form. So I think Foucault has the history exactly backwards just on that particular claim. Now it's not to say that you can't go into 1920s or 1870s and go into some communities and find that there are dominant groups that are trying to marginalize and exclude subgroups. But uh, as a general reading of the history of the modern world, I think Foucault has it exactly backwards. Also, Foucault, uh, this is the philosophy part of, uh, of Foucault, uh, wants to say this is not just historical accident. This is something built into the human condition. That uh, He really is deeply a Nietzschean on this point, that human beings are fundamentally motivated by power, the will to power, and that the power only works by my uh, uh, subordinating you and assuming your power for myself. So the only way I can advance is by belittling some other group's power. And so uh, 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 that reading of history then is philosophically f formed by the view that there is only power struggle and strong dominating the weak. And again, I think philosophically that's an incorrect analysis. I think that's our time for questions. Okay. So please, one more time, give it up for